Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Tempo Talks. I am your host, Tempo. Our guest today doesn't just make video games, he puts animatronic talking dinosaurs in them. In a little series you may have heard of called Dinotopia. Dov, would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, my name is Dov Jacobson. I'm a game designer, producer, and during the making of Dinotopia, I was, um, I suppose, the creative director. Yeah, I was the studio head of Turner Interactive which was the publisher and developer of, uh, of uh, Dinotopia. So this game came out in the early 90s, and I was really stoked about it because it used my shiny new CD-ROM drive. But for our listeners who may not remember, do you want to catch us up on it? Yeah, so Dinotopia, Living the Adventure, was, uh, it was the first game, in fact, I think the first media product at all, made out of the Dinotopia series, uh, other than the books, of course. And we worked closely with James Gurney and uh, Beanstalk, which is his... Uh, publishing agency. And the most important part of Dinotopia are the uh, dinosaur characters. And at this time, this was 1995, uh, 96. And we looked at the the state of the art for, for 3D animation. And back then, there was not a lot of the kind of facial rigging, you know, that's really easily available now. It really didn't exist even at the the best studios. You could move bodies around, but you couldn't move faces around. You couldn't get expression. So we decided to, to go with an older, more reliable, more expressive, more human uh, technology, which was um, puppeteering, animatronics, whatever you want. I, I tend to call it more puppeteering because it wasn't operated by automation. It was operated by live puppeteers, as many as seven uh, puppeteers sometimes, and some of the more complicated rigs. Another part of it isn't just where the technology was, it's also kind of where Atlanta is, the talent that was available. Atlanta has reasonably good computer animators, but had really, really good puppeteers. It has the Center for Puppetry Arts, just the really focal point for for the puppet, you know, art form uh, is here. So there was, we could get really dedicated full-time puppet teams where we had a leader, uh, like a head puppeteer, uh, orchestrating a team of Three, four, five, six, seven, depending on how many how complicated the character was. So, how does this differ from Jurassic Park, the other animatronic dinosaur thing that came out in the early '90s? Well, I mean, the, you know, the, the basic, you know, the most clear, the most obvious one is uh, you're supposed to be scared of, the, of, of Jurassic Park characters, whereas you're supposed to be empathetic. Yeah, I mean, you're looking for empathy for the most of the uh, dinosaurs in Dinotopia. They're individual characters. They weren't a species. I mean, I don't think you could tell one velociraptor. Maybe with a lot of uh, care, you might be able to tell one velociraptor from another in Jurassic Park, but it really didn't matter. Whereas the individual characters were critical in Dinotopia. Very well-developed, deep characters. My personal favorite happens to be a velociraptor in the game, Anno, who teaches you to play a card game and swindles you. But she's so charming that you don't actually mind. Trust me, you will love this game. Actually, you're lucky there's no line right now. Usually, you have to wait hours. Luck is a good thing to have when you visit Anno. Like I said, charming Velociraptor. So what was the process of making the game like? Really, you know, of course, it starts with Gurney. I mean, we, we were so sort of slavish to him. We thought he did a pretty damn good job. We didn't want to try to invent um, new characters. I love the Flintstones, but I wasn't above creating new characters for our Flintstone product. But but for this, we wanted to stay uh, with with the characters he created. And it was kind of a um, point of pride how, how close we could get to the human and, and the Saurian characters. So the first place, you know, it starts with, with Gurney. The, the next thing is is the voice actor because the performance is driven by the voice actor. But before that, you know, long before that, actually, there was the negotiation with the model maker because each character had different mobility in their face. Some could roll their eyes. Some had eyelids. Some would have corners in their mouth that they could pull upward and, so they could smile. And And each of those hit our budget. Each of those made it, the job of the model maker longer, more complicated, and slowed down the the production. Each of those required a puppet, you know, an actual person operating it. 
No, an, op, uh, an operator could operate two or three muscles, but that's about it. Even three would be a lot. Usually, often it was an important uh, feature, like the eyes. You know, there was one person who did the eyes all the time, one person who did the mouth, the gaze direction, and then all the the smaller muscles you know, around the frown, the brow crunch, the you know the lip curl. Uh, we had lip curl too. Some ca- I can't remember which ones had a lip curl, but. If that character was going to be a little snotty, you need to be able to have muscles in there besides just the mouth smiling. If you want him to sneer, you had to put that extra rigging into the front of the lips to be able to pull back, or create that, that, that expression. So every expression that we intended the character to have, which you know was driven by the, the essence of the character, and also the, the lines and the, you know, the, the situations that you know, she was going to be in, each of those required engineering, considerable amount of mechanical engineering ahead of time. Most of the uh, puppets were operated mechanically. Some electronics, I even think we had some hydraulics, but the vast majority of it was pulleys and shafts. Uh, yeah, but more complex. It was very, I don't think we had any of them that you'd stick your hand into. For the most part, they were mounted on a fixture and the puppeteers would be behind it or underneath it or sometimes in front of it. The ones that were doing the more complex facial expressions would be in front watching, although we'd also, of course, have video so the people behind could see what the character looked like too. Yeah, it's kind of important <laughs> if you're trying to move a few muscles on a dinosaur's face to be able to see what you're doing. So whereas Jurassic Park just had to make things snarl and bite, you had to have everything packed with that Jim Henson style control hardware. So the rigs were actually really complex and had ways to make eyebrows raise and lower and teeth bare and cover up and have various muscles moving around under the skin. Not just to be scary and predatory, but to be something that people could decode into emotion, which is necessary if you're gonna have people relate to these characters. It looks pretty seamless in the finished product, but it's actually a pretty big technical and artistic challenge. You not only need mechanical engineering, you need biology and human psychology and all of this nuance built into the performance. It's hard enough to get someone to step in front of a camera and emote in a natural way, and we do that all day. It's much more complex to have an entire team where people at every stage understand what the end goal is and are communicating about that. You have to have everybody on the same page. So how did you guys accomplish that? We did live performances of the audio. I don't think we were we were acting to pre-recorded audio. It may not have been the same for all of them also, but my, my background is drawn animation, even before computers, you know, and in stop action or drawn 2D animation, the voice is always recorded first and the animator works to a, a soundtrack. And that helps enormously to animate it correctly, but it does mean that once the actor is finished, the performance is fixed, which is okay. But we had an advantage because if we could work with a live actor, we could grow the performance over time. You know, we could see, oh, you know, maybe him sneering is so good. We want to pause a little bit there or add a sneer because we've got, you know, we've got that particular expression going. Or the characters, he just has to talk slower because look how, how big he is and how slow he moves. And we thought we anticipated it, but doesn't sound right. So what we had, let's see now, we would have a voice and a sound guy would have three and then one crazy one had seven uh but you know a handful of puppeteers and then i would be there trying to hold it all together and then one of the puppeteers was the head puppeteer so when we wanted an expression he would tell all the people who had to compose that expression to do and and, and make sure that they were synchronized and then uh, you know we had a couple of pas we had a pa named perry who Pretty much ran the whole operation, filled in all the places where people felt that she's the secret hero of the whole project. So you had this whole orchestra of puppeteers and voice actors and production assistants, and it sounds exciting. Oh, absolutely. It was exciting because, like I say, almost all the work I've done is not real time. I personally was always afraid of performance. I was afraid of anything that was real time that you could only do once and you had to be right. Or even things that you did real time, if you could do it again, because I like to think things through really carefully. So animation was was really well suited to me because you'd spend weeks to make a second of animation sometimes. But, but this was liberating. For me, it was kind of a break. I had just 
learned to direct voices not long before, which was part of breaking through to real-time performance. And I was scared of it before then, but there was a lot of, well, there was a lot of momentum and it was easy to learn. When I say momentum, there's a lot of talent in the room. Uh, and it really just needed, from my point of view, just to not get in their way and to, you know, be the person who remembered, or if I forgot, Perry would remind me what that character was about, what that scene was about, where we had to go. Recording a, a game is not like recording a film or something like that, or acting in a play. You're not taking it from across a dramatic arc. You're making a lot of tiny little elements, some of which will be experienced by the player in an order that you're not going to be able to control. And from a directing point of view, that's one of the hardest things is to make sure that the performers understand the context of each line because the lines are sort of random. There's a whole stack of lines that you need to record, you know, you, and, and there's not a lot of context for them. Well, that was my job is to provide, remind them why, why that character would be saying this at this particular point in the game. And there's some technical uh, difficulties as well. In the game, since you have all these different recordings of all the things that could, can happen, and you don't know that the order that they're going to be played in or which ones are going to be played at all, you have to make it so that each one leads into every other one. And what that means, uh, typically, or every game I've ever been in, whether it's computer animated or motion capture or puppeteering in this case, or even live action, what that means is we have a neutral pose. That means I might get really angry, but at the end of the anger, I'm going to work it out to land in that neutral pose naturally. I have to act into the pose. I can't just act and then go back, you know, retract into the pose. That's, that's an awful feeling. I have to create a motion that naturally brings me to that, that all the energy is still going forward. It's not just I say my thing and then I go back. Rather, I say my thing and it just happens that at the end of it, I'm right at the right spot. And I'm not moving because it's not just hitting the pose. You have to hit the pose and stick it. So in order to stick the landing, you had to have every operator know where the neutral position was for that scene on that particular lever or pulley or what have you. And the whole team of them had to hit it at the same time. So they had to be watching for when other people were going to hit their marks. That's pretty analog compared to video game animation now. Oh, yeah. Every, that was a big part. Is that every operator knows exactly, you know, if, if I'm responsible for the jaw, I know that in the neutral pose, it's exactly this much. And typically, the first thing we do is record the neutral pose so we can play it for them. If there's ever a question, are we in the neutral pose? We play the canonical neutral pose recording so that we wouldn't drift also. We don't want to say, oh, I'm just in the same neutral pose that I started in. I'm in the same neutral pose that I began in at 9 o'clock in the morning because we keep referring back to that one. Not every shoot was one day. I think we had a couple that were two or three days. And looking at the finished game, did you always use one animatronic dinosaur at a time? Oh, yeah, we only did one. Uh, was it, did we ever do more than one dinosaur? No, we only did one dinosaur at a time. Because you had the scene where the Demetrodon flies down the Brachiosaur's throat on, like, this cough syrup Star Wars trench run. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be... I'm almost certain that we didn't, I wanted to do multiple ones at a time, but it was too complicated. Yeah. And so they were all life-size because that Demetrodon looked pretty small, as small as he should be when he is composited in there next to the sore-throated Brachiosaur. So were all these dinosaurs life-size compared to the operators? Oh no, they were all different scales. Yeah, I kind of wanted them to be life-size, but um, the economics. Video game budgets have the power to shrink dinosaurs. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, yeah, we, the, the size was depending on how complicated the machinery had to be inside that was going to move. So how big were they? Well, most of them were pretty big. We did have a life-size triceratops. Brokorn was pretty much life-size because we went to the Consumer Electronics Show to, to show off the game. No, I'm sorry. It was, it was big, the public for Brokorn. It wasn't really life-size because, Jesus, that would be huge. But we, we did allow people to green screen themselves in next to uh, Brokorn, and, and we sent them home with uh, pictures themselves in Van Dopey. So what advantages did you have with animatronics that you wouldn't have had with computer animation? Yeah, the big advantage, well, one of our big advantages is the talent that was available to us 
the model making talent. Andre, he built beautiful, beautiful puppets. He had a team of model makers and, and uh, engineers that built gorgeous, gorgeous characters that would have been hard at that time to do with computer graphics, even static images, but certainly the way they moved would not have been possible with computer graphics. It, it would be possible now. Yeah, I mean, things have moved, changed a lot. I'm a, kind of a fan of, of guys like George Powell and Harry Hausen, and they didn't have a choice. They're using you know, real three-dimensional characters. They got a kind of quality, I think, that until recently you haven't been able to get with computers. Oh, what did they make? Uh, it seemed to be the sailor. This is like the 40s and 30s. They were not that different from the way we were working. You know, some of them were puppets. Some of them were stop action. And Andre Freitas has gone on to work on all the animatronics for The Walking Dead, all the Marvel movies. Last time I talked to him, he was on the set of a Captain America movie. Oh, I didn't know that. I, I kind of lost track of, of Andre. Andre was doing... A lot of work with the wrestlers here. That's where he started out, making um, prosthetics and things for, for wrestlers. But then he does beautiful work for us. And then I, I assume he must have gone on. So he's working for Marvel now? Yeah. I'm not surprised. Oh, that's perfect for him. You know, he does great animals. He does great monsters. But he's kind of really fond of zombies. Andre Freitas, we were lucky that we met him early in his career, where he had tons of ambition, tons of talent and skill, because he'd been working at doing a lot of wrestling prosthetic, what they call moulage. Moulage is the uh, prosthetics that look like injuries. So, you know, if you want to have broken bones sticking out of your skin, it's moulage. So he, he was very skilled at that and really skilled at making characters and, and, and well-articulated puppets. Uh, and we could still afford him. We had a pretty good budget. He was here in Atlanta and uh, he had a rather large shop. And he was able to make large-scale, well-articulated characters. Uh, and he understood the, how the puppeteers were supposed to work. Although, of course, the puppeteers would come into his shop and talk to him as he was, engin- as he was building the armatures. And that's AFX Studios in Atlanta. He gave us both a standing invitation. So if we're ever down there, we'll have to do another episode. <laughs> While we're there, surrounded by dinosaurs, because they're still there, I checked. So why is all this stuff in Atlanta? Who knew? Oh, well, you have to come to Atlanta. Frankly, you know, I've lost track of a lot of people, but a lot of the puppeteers were very interesting, committed, talented people. Good people to, keep, to get back in touch with. Yeah, and we've harassed a few of them the last couple of years since I've started talking to you. So why was it worth all this trouble to animate non-human characters when you could have just hired actors? Non-human characters are interesting because in computer animation, we have a principle called the uncanny valley. It's where the closer you get to a human being, the worse it looks. Up to a point. You know, up to a point, if you have a, a picture of Fred Flintstone, everybody believes that's a real character. They believe in everything he does, because they're not judging the fidelity of the rendering. When you get to a 3D model character that's supposed to be realistic, the closer it gets, the more your eye focuses on the ways that it's not real, because uh, we've evolved to identify a sick person or, uh, or an evil person by little tiny things that are wrong with them. And you start triggering all that stuff. Computer animated humans still look like zombies half the time. And the closer you get, the more subtle the difference is. You know, okay, yeah, her skin, you know, looks like a human. And if I saw just a still picture, I almost believe she's a human. But when she moves, everything's right, but not quite right. And that's disturbing. But you don't have that when you don't try that hard to reproduce a human being. You can focus instead on the, on the real character. The character can emerge in a cartoon. And also the, the same is true of an of a anthropomorphic animal. I mean, there's certainly value to animals that are supposed to be animals. But there's an enormous special value to animals that are supposed to represent people, but not super literally, but you know, metaphorically. They're, they're characters. They're, yeah, they're, they're characters, but you can focus on the character more than you could if it's a human. And we focus on them a lot on this channel. <laughs> Um, Dov, I know you got to get going, so... Right. I told my wife I'd be back again. <laughs> well, we don't need the wisdom of the dinosaurs to know I shouldn't keep you then. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's always wonderful to talk to you. Okay. Good to talk to you. All right, folks. Don't forget to subscribe. We've got more of these coming, including more Gretsuko voice actors and the provincial government of Nova Scotia. If you think I'm kidding on that one, just stay tuned. 
In the meantime, remember to breathe deep, seek peace, and exercise imagination. Because imagination is what drives us forward on our own adventure toward utopia, dinosaur or otherwise. Though you folks will not be surprised that I will always choose Talking Dinosaur. This has been your host, Tempo. If you're curious about the books I write, you can find links in the description. Till next time, take care.